Amen. Thank you, Brother Chris. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible now, if you will, and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22. Matthew, chapter 22. Uh, some time ago, I, I suppose it's been a year or maybe longer uh, than that, uh, a couple of the ladies here in the church did me a huge favor and decided to catalog all of my sermon notes, and they put uh, in different folders according to the book that the text is from. And they told me something that I myself didn't know. They said, you've preached out of the Gospel of Matthew more than any other book. I, I did not realize that, but that's, that's what they came up with. And I thought about why that would be, and, and it didn't take long to think about it, because Matthew is the longest of the Gospels, and it tells us more about Jesus and contains more of Jesus' words than any other book. And so I think that it is... Uh, it's a good reason to go to Matthew more than anything else because that's where you're going to find, again, more of the words of Jesus. I'll tell you a little uh, story, a true story. I was a senior in high school. I hadn't been saved very long, a matter of weeks. And uh, a class I was taking was English literature. And so our assignment was to do a book report on an uh, English biography and so I did my book report on the Gospel of Matthew. And the teacher, who actually uh, was a Sunday school teacher in a, in a local church, gave me an F on my, my book report. And I went to him and I asked him why he gave me an F. He said, well, <laughs> look at what you did. He says, you did your report on the Gospel of Matthew. The assignment was to do it on an English biography. And said, you, first of all, it's not a biography. And secondly, it's not English. And I said to him, I, I tried to be respectful. I said, well, sir, it certainly is a biography. I said, it's the life story of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I said, secondly, the King James Version of the Bible is one of the greatest works of, if not the greatest work of English literature has ever been. He changed my grade. <laughs> and I appreciated that. But uh, we talked this morning about who is a saint and who ain't. And we understand that saints are those who have been saved by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. He goes on to say we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We didn't use those verses this morning, but that also is a description of how a person becomes a saint by grace. The center of the Christian faith, the center of hope for all Christians of all time is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He goes on from there and talks about how many people saw the Lord after his resurrection. That's the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Again, the centerpiece of the Christian faith. But what about the resurrection of the saints? What about the resurrection of the believers? When are they resurrected? And how are they resurrected? There's so much scripture that talks about that. Uh, we're not going to these two passages tonight, but you might want to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, and the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, both of those deal with the resurrection of the saints. Those aren't the only ones, but those are probably the most lengthy passages that you'll find. But I want us once again to come back to the words of Jesus. So in uh, Matthew chapter 22, we're going to be looking at verses 23 to 33. But to begin with, I would like to read to you and read with you <clears throat> verses 31 and 32. Matthew 22 verses 31 and 32. The Lord Jesus speaking, he says, But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, 
the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but God of the living. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for the promise of eternal life. And Father, it is our prayer that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher and our guide tonight. Bring to memory those things that you would have said and block from memory those things which you would not have said. Cause us, Father, to be open to your word, to your teaching. Deal with our hearts. Speak to us as with children. Lord, if there's a soul listening who doesn't know you, doesn't have assurance of salvation, may they come and trust you in this hour. And for those who do know you, strengthen our faith. Encourage us, we pray. Help us to look forward to what you are going to do and help us to be thankful for that which you have done and continue to do. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Job is probably the oldest book of the Bible, the first book of the Bible written. Now, if we've talked about this before. You say, well, if it's the first book written, why isn't it the first book of the Bible? We've talked about this before. The books of the Bible are not assembled necessarily in chronological order. They're somewhat chronological, but that's not how they're put together. They're put together by subject matter. You have the five books of the law, and then you have the books of history, and then you have the books of poetry, and then you have the major prophets, then you have the minor prophets, then you have the gospels, one book of history in the New Testament, the book of the Acts, then you have the epistles, and then one book of prophecy in the New Testament, the Revelation. So they're grouped by subject. So Job comes uh, closer to the middle of the Old Testament and in, in its placement, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's where it falls chronologically. I said it's the, probably the oldest book of the Bible. I'm gonna go a step farther, and I know some would disagree with this, and that's fine, but I think it's possibly the first book that was ever written. Now, I can't prove that to you. No way I could prove that to you, but it makes sense that it would be. I also believe Job is a true story. I say, well, it's written in poetic form. It is written in poetic form, but I don't have any question that Job was an actual man who lived. It gives us uh, where he lived and, and talked about that. And I think he was a man uh, whose story is told as it happened. Well, what's that got to do with what we're reading here in the Gospel of Matthew? And what's that got to do with our subject tonight, the resurrection of the saints? And I'll tell you what it has to do with it. It has to do with the fact that Job, who lived probably before Abraham, Job believed in the resurrection. Well, how do you know that? Well, I know that because he said so. Job chapter 19, verses 25 to 27, Job says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know my Redeemer lives. Now, number one, that tells us Job knew he needed a Redeemer. Number two, it tells us Job knew he had a Redeemer. And number three, it tells us he knew that his Redeemer was alive. Not going to be alive, not had been alive, is alive. He says, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day, the latter day, prophetic reference always to the end times, the last days of earth. He shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. What a statement. Job says, I know my Redeemer. I know I have a Redeemer. I know I need a Redeemer. I have a Redeemer. I know he's living today. And I know that when the end of the world comes, he'll be standing on the earth. But that's verse 25. Verse 26, Job says, And though after my skin, worms shall destroy this body. What is he talking about? He says, when, when I've died and my body's in the grave and the worms are devouring it. He says, I'm after, I'm sorry, And though after my skin, worms shall destroy this body, yet in my flesh, important statement, he says, in my flesh, I shall see God. After I'm dead and buried, worms have devoured my flesh. In my flesh, I shall see God. How is that possible without a resurrection? It isn't. It isn't possible without a resurrection. But that's verse 26. We need to also consider verse 27. 
So let's go back. Let me go back to verse 25 and get you the flow of the entire thought. Job said, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin shall destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Again, he's saying, after I'm dead and decayed, I'm going to see him with my own eyes. I'm going to see my Redeemer. Where? Standing on earth at the latter days. Job believed in the resurrection. And for the most part, the people of Israel in biblical times accepted and believed in the doctrines of resurrection, the doctrines of eternal life, and the doctrine of heaven. Now I say for the most part because there was one sect who did not believe these things. Uh, we don't read about them ever in the Old Testament. But we do read about them in the Gospels. This group was very much like too many people are today. It was a group called the Sadducees, and they denied the resurrection. They denied eternal life, and they denied any life in heaven. They were the people who said, as a, as a dog dies, so a man dies. When you're dead, you're dead. That's it. It's over. Uh, there's nothing else. You live your life, you're born, you live your life, you die, and that's it. No afterlife, no heaven, no hell. And it was this group who came to Jesus. Others had come to question him, but it was their turn. It was this group who came to Jesus to question him in the passage before us, Matthew 22, 23 to 33. There are people who like to ask questions. Uh, so a lot of people call them gotcha questions, the kind of questions that they think you can't answer. Uh, a lot of people like to ask Christians questions like that. You know, can God make a rock so big that not even he can lift it? Uh, how many angels can fit on the head of a pen? Uh, just questions like that. They think, well, you just, you just can't even answer that. You know, the Bible addresses those questions it says answer not a fool according to his folly and 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 that's exactly what a, what a silly question could God make a rock so big not even he could lift it what you know there is an answer to that oh go ahead and answer it, it it'd take us the rest of the evening to give you a thorough answer and then when we got finished probably uh, 75 percent of the people listening would say I don't even know what you were talking about <laughs> so it's just, it's, it's, my point is it's not worth bothering with. It's just really not. So they thought they had a gotcha question. They thought they were going to ask Jesus a question that, that he couldn't answer. Others had come to him. The Pharisees had come to him. The Herodians had come to him with their questions, and he had answered them. The Sadducees, it was their turn. They thought, we got a question he can't answer. They're going to base it upon the law the law of Moses. But they're going to incorporate with the question their belief that there is no eternity, no resurrection, no heaven. And they're going to conclude that Jesus can't answer this one and by he not answering it, therefore we know that he cannot be the Messiah. Can't be. If he were the Messiah, he'd know how to answer this question. So here it is. Matthew 22 and verse 23. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, here's their question, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now, first thing you have to stop and ask yourself is, did Moses actually write that is that in the law is that in the law that god gave through moses and the answer to that question is yes it is well i'd like to know where that is well i'm glad you asked it is in deuteronomy chapter 25 verses 5 and 6. i wonder what that says well uh, again i'm glad you asked deuteronomy 25 5 and 6 says if brethren dwell together two brothers living same place if brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, 
the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. What does that mean? She's not to marry someone not of the house of Israel. Let me begin again. If brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and shall take her to him to wife to perform the duty of an husband unto her, and it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. That last phrase is so important to understanding this commandment, that his name be not put out of Israel. Now, some few things you need to understand about that. Number one, this is the law given by God through Moses to Israel. Number two, it's given at a time when Israel is going into the promised land. They're not even there yet, but they're going to be there. And God gave them commandments for when they arrived in the promised land, how they were going to live, how their society would be. And God is keeping his covenant with Abraham to make of Abraham a great nation. So it all has to do with God keeping his covenant to Israel uh, through Israel to Abraham. Here's the thing. The covenant says there'll be a land. He's bringing them to the promised land. There'll be a nation. That's the people. And this would be a great nation. It can't be a small nation. It has to be a great nation. And through this nation, all the families of the earth will be blessed. You find all this in Genesis chapter 12. So the law means this. They're in the land. They're growing the nation. And here's this man. He married a wife and he passes away and there's no child. He has a brother who can marry the widow according to this law and bring up children in his brother's name so that his brother's line, his brother's uh, heritage does not pass away. Now hear me. Do we need to abide by that commandment today? No. Why not? This was a commandment given to and for the people of Israel, to and for the propagation of the nation of Israel in that land. Let me, let me put it in another frame of reference for you. In this same commandment, it says, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. She's not to marry anybody who is not of the house of Israel. All right, why is that? Because God is building the nation of Israel. And if the daughters go out and marry people from other countries and cultures, first of all, the Lord doesn't want them bringing in their idolatry, but beyond that, the Lord is building up this nation. The nation through which the Bible will come, the nation through which the Savior will come. The nation through which God will bless all the earth. Let me give you another example of this. You know the story of Ruth. Now, Ruth and her husband had gone uh, into Moab, and they had two sons, and their two sons married Moabite women. The Moabites were descendants of Lot, so they're not part of the Abrahamic covenant. And as you know the story, the two sons died. And Naomi decides to go back to her homeland, which happened to be the vicinity of Bethlehem. And she's going to go back there, and she tells her daughters-in-law, you stay here in the land of Moab. Uh, I, I'm, I don't have anything here. I have no husband. I have no sons. I have no way to earn a living here. I'm going to go back to my people where I came from. And the one daughter-in-law stays there, but Ruth says, no, I, where you're going, I'm going. And your God will be my God, and your people will be my people. She's trusting in God. Ruth goes back to uh, Bethlehem with Naomi, and there she marries Boaz, who is the near kinsman. It's all in keeping with that Abrahamic covenant. It's all in keeping with what... It's happening in Deuteronomy 25, 5, and 6. Well, he wasn't their brother, no, but he was the closest kinsman who could have married her. 
And so he did. Now, Ruth and Boaz, as romantic a story as that is, and, and it's a good story all by itself. It's a good story, but there's so much more. Ruth, Ruth and Boaz have a son named Obed. Obed has a son named Jesse, and Jesse has a son named David. And David has a great, 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 great grandson named Jesus. You see how God is working in all of that. And that's why this commandment, Deuteronomy 25, 5, and 6, was so important to keep the messianic line and to keep God's promises that he made to Abraham. Hope that makes sense to you. So that's the center of what they're talking about here. When they say in, in Matthew 22, 24, Master Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Well, that's right. And we just, just went through that. So here's their gotcha question. Based on this, Master, one who claims to be the Messiah, let us tell you what happened to our, our, in our group. You know, those of us Sadducees. Verse 25, now there were with us seven brethren. Seven brothers, one family. There were with us seven brethren. The first, when he had married a wife, deceased. And having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. <clears throat> now they're saying that's according to the law of Moses. Verse 26, likewise the second also, and the third unto the seven. So, this woman marries the oldest of seven brothers. He passes away. No children. Second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, down to seven. She married all seven of them. They have no children. Uh, sad story. Verse 27. And last of all, the woman died also. You would expect that to happen eventually. Therefore, according to the law of Moses, therefore... Here these seven men married the same woman. None of them have any children. Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Ah, gotcha. Can't answer that one, can you? Okay. Now it'd be easy answer. We know if one of them had had a child. But none of them had children. So in the resurrection, whose wife is she? Jesus answered, not only answers their question, but tells us a great deal about resurrection and heaven. Take a look at it. Verse 25. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, verse 29. Verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Now that's what the Lord said. And, and there's no indication to believe he did anything other than just say that. No reason to think that at all. But I'm going to tell you how they looked at it. They looked at it as if he had reached out and slapped them across the face. That's how they looked at it. Why? Because he said to them, surely you do err. And the phrase you do err there means surely you deceive yourselves. You're lying to yourself. And you don't even realize it. But it becomes even more insulting to them because of the next phrase. He says, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. You know what? That's what really was like a slap in the face to them because they, the Lord says, you don't know the Bible. You don't know the scriptures. You don't know God's power. You see, they prided themselves on knowing the scriptures. Oh, the Pharisees felt that they knew the scriptures better than the Sadducees. That's to be sure. But the Sadducees felt that they had a pretty good handle on it. And they knew the scriptures. And that's why they didn't believe in the resurrection and heaven and hell and all that. Because they knew the scriptures better than anybody. And Jesus telling them, you don't even understand the scripture. You don't even know what you're talking about. That's what he said. Folks, you read your Bible, just believe your Bible. Don't start mixing into it all kinds of extraneous ideas that have no biblical basis whatsoever. I've had so many conversations. I had one just this last week with somebody. 
And uh, they said, well, which gospel saves people in this present age? And I said, well, there's in every age, there's only one gospel that has ever saved people. Oh, the person got mad at me. They didn't like that at all. I didn't say it. I didn't say this at all, but I felt like saying, you do err, not knowing the scriptures. You know, I, I didn't say that, but I was thinking it. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. And he's about to teach them. If this were 21st century America, uh, the slang for that would say, He's going to school them. <laughs> and he is. Verse 30, Jesus says, For in the resurrection... They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are the, as the angels of God in heaven. Now that's not a very long verse, but it says a great deal. First of all, it says in the resurrection, in eternity. There is a resurrection, Jesus is saying, and there is an eternity. And in the resurrection in heaven, these are accepted facts. And he says... In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. That does not mean that when you die, you go to heaven and become an angel. That's not what he's saying. He's saying you're as the angels of God. What does that mean? Well, angels apparently do not reproduce. They are created beings, but they do not reproduce. And one of the reasons for marriage is to do what? Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. Well, there's no reason for angels to do that. So they don't. And he's saying that humans in the resurrection are going to be like that. And maybe somebody's listening to this right now and they're saying, I don't like that idea. I love my husband. I love my wife. I want to be with him. He's not saying you won't be with him. But he's saying it's, it's not going to matter. The question they're asking that this woman had married all seven that's that's immaterial has nothing to do with it now there are some questions that come out of this teaching that the lord gave that aren't so easy to answer i'm going to tell you what i think but let me stress this is what i think you may get to heaven say it's not there and that that guy didn't know what he was talking about and, and that's fine because when we're there, we'll know how it actually is, won't we? But I believe what the Lord is saying here, and again, this is my idea. I believe that in heaven, we are all one family. God is our father, and we are brothers and sisters. You know, if you get to heaven and that's not how it is, then again, you can say, well, he didn't know. But I, I honestly think that's what the Lord is saying here. So again, it's immaterial. Their, their, their question doesn't matter. There's something bigger taught here. Verse 31. But as touching the resurrection of the dead. He's saying the main part of your question, the reason you asked me this question to begin with, is you're trying to prove that there is no resurrection, that belief in the resurrection is silly. So he's going to teach them. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, and here comes another slap across the face to them, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying? You see, back in verse 29, he said, you don't know the scriptures. In verse 31, he's saying, haven't you even read the scriptures? You pride yourself in knowing the scriptures. You know it forwards and backwards and inside out. You think you know it so well. You don't know the scriptures. He says, verse 29, verse 31, he says, it's like you never even read. He's saying you do deceive yourselves. You are the ones who do not know what you're talking about. And if anybody is going to know about eternity, it would be him. says have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God saying verse 32 this is so key I am the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob now they referenced Moses 
And Jesus here is quoting to them from Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, where the Lord at the burning bush introduces himself to Moses and calls Moses. And the Lord says to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And later in that same passage, when Moses says, when I go to the people, whom am I going to say has sent me? And the Lord says, I am that I am. I am has sent thee. And I am the self-existent one. The one who is the uncaused cause. I am the eternal one. But what the Lord is teaching them here is this. And look at it again, verse 32. This is what God says, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. Not only had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob been dead for hundreds of years, thousands of years really, before Jesus walked the earth and these Sadducees asked the question, I want you to understand this. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been dead for hundreds of years before Moses was born. Moses, during his time here on earth, never saw Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. Now, he saw their descendants. He was one of them. But he never had seen Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. Here's what's so important. And <clears throat> by the way, this is why when you read your Bible, every word is important. And the wording of it is important. And the translation of the words into our language, or any language for that matter, is important. That you, that you get it right. So that we know exactly what God says. It, it makes huge difference. Look at verse 32. God says, I am. I am. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. What he did not say, he didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, uh, Isaac and Jacob. He didn't say I was their God. He didn't say I used to be their God. He said, I am their God. Well, isn't that just playing with semantics? No, it isn't. It's extremely important because Jesus is making a very, very important point here. 32 again, I am the God of Abraham, present tense. I am, present tense, the God of Isaac. I am, present tense, the God of Jacob. God is not God of the dead, but of the living. What Jesus is saying here is what you men need to understand is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're all still alive. They didn't used to be, they are. And God didn't used to be their God, he is their God. Now, with their kind of belief, they might have looked around and said, well, I don't see them standing around here. No, you don't. That's not, this isn't where they live. Everybody, everybody in this room and everybody listening to me knows people. You know them. You know who they are. You know that they're alive, but you don't see them because they're not where you are. That doesn't mean that they don't exist. They're living. They're just not living in the time and space that you're in right now. So Jesus is saying Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are still alive. God is not God of the dead, but God of the living. And he's saying that they're in heaven. Finally, verse 33 and when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. They had never heard teaching like this before. The scribes and the Pharisees did not teach with such authority. We're told that in another place. The Sadducees, who were so proud of their peculiar belief, had not been put in their place this way before. They argued with each other. But now they've come not to argue with each other. They've come to argue with God himself. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath, present tense, everlasting life. Not will have, not is going to have, has right now everlasting life. That's John 6, 47. As Job said, the body may die, 
but the life does not end there. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7 says this, The dust shall return to the earth as it was, and the spirit to God who gave it. Now Solomon wrote that, and what he's saying is, when the body dies, it dies, but the spirit goes to God. Well, what about the resurrection of the body? As I told you earlier, you can read about that, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses uh, 13 to 18, and 1 Corinthians 15, the whole chapter really, but verses 51 and 52 say this, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment and the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Now, I want to share with you just one other verse. And I was going to go to another entire passage, but I think we're, we're running short on time here. I, I, need, I need to take you over there. Let me, let me take you over there. We're in... Uh, we're in Matthew chapter... 20, 27, Matthew chapter 27, and come down, if you will, to verse, let's come to verse 50, Matthew 27, verse 50, seen as the cross, and Matthew 27, 50, says Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And we're about to read a statement here that appears only here in Matthew 27, verse 52. Nowhere else will you see this. So that leaves some questions, and we'll answer a couple of them, but can't answer all of them. 51 again, Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. 52, and the graves were opened. When were the graves opened? When that earthquake occurred. When did that earthquake occur? When Jesus died. There was an earthquake. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Do you see that? When Jesus died on the cross, there was an earthquake, graves were opened up, and many who were dead arose. Verse 53, they came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, when did the graves open when Jesus died? When did they go in the holy city after his resurrection? Boy, what, they, they stayed there in the grave for a couple more days? Yeah, apparently. Came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, there's questions that that raises that, that I can't give you a definitive answer to. Like, for example, who were these people? Well, all we know is that they were many bodies of the saints. They were believers who had died. Doesn't tell us who they were. Believers who had died. Doesn't tell us how many there were, says there were many. It tells us that they went into the holy city, that would be Jerusalem, and they showed themselves alive. Well, here's the next question. What happened after that? We're not told. I don't think they went back to their graves and laid down and died again. Don't, don't get that idea. That, that wouldn't even make sense. They may have stayed and lived with their families or their friends and, and lived out another lifespan, but I don't think so. What do you think happened? I think when Jesus ascended up to heaven 40 days after the resurrection, he took them with him. That's what I think. I can't prove that to you. The Bible doesn't say what happened to them. That's what I think probably happened is that the Lord took them with him when he ascended to heaven. Again, that's my idea. It's not what the Bible says. I want to be very clear about that. 
There was a resurrection of the saints that coincided with his death, burial, and resurrection. Verse 54 says, Now when the centurion, the Roman captain of a hundred soldiers, who was there at the cross, when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake, and those things that were done, they feared greatly. I imagine so. I would think so, wouldn't you? They feared greatly. Saying, truly, this was the Son of God. John 14, 19, Jesus said, Because I live, ye shall live also. John eleven twenty three 23 to 27 Jesus spoke to Martha, whose brother Lazarus had died, and he said, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said, I know that he shall rise again at the resurrection of the last day. See, she knew that. She understood there's going to be a resurrection at the last day. I know that Lazarus will resurrect. And you've you got to understand the people of Israel believed in resurrection. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Martha said, Yea, Lord, I believe. I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which had come into the world. And that leads us to the next question. Do you believe? Do you know that you will be included in the resurrection of the saints? If you don't, you can. Jesus said again, He that believes on me has everlasting life. Put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there anything between your soul and the Savior if you're a believer? If so, there's no better time than right now to take care of that. Let's go to him in prayer. Father,